Hello, my name is Russ Miller of Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, and we're about to take a look at what Scripture tells us about God's week-long creation event. We need to look at, are the six days of creation in Genesis 1 symbolic poetry, or are they supposed to be taken as factual historical events? Well, languages have sentences which generally consist of subjects, verbs, and objects. And linguists say that the order that these are found in differ between poetic descriptions and historical factual statements. Hebrew is usually subject, verb, object, SVO, when poetic, as in the Psalms. However, Hebrew is usually VSO when talking about factual historical events. Well, all of Genesis 1 is VSO, verb, subject, object. Genesis 1 is to be taken as a historical account of God's creation event. It's not poetic myth. In fact, Professor James Barr, who was former professor of Hebrew at Oxford, stated, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey that creation took place in six 24-hour days. And the genealogies provide a chronology from the beginning of the world. Arguments which suppose the days to be long eras of time are not taken seriously by any such professor. The Hebrew word for day is yom or yom. Yom is almost always referring to a day, but it can refer to a period of time. The Hebrew word olam actually means age or period of time, and Moses should have used this word if he were discussing anything other than a literal solar day. Yom is first used in Genesis 1, verse 5. God sets the six-day, 24-hour time frame three different ways. First, Yom is defined as the period of light followed by the period of darkness. Then God sets the bounds as the evening and the morning, and He numbers each day. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Notice that each day is half light and half darkness. This eliminates any long age per day belief. Adam, we're told, lived 930 years. Well, if each day is a billion years, we've got problems because in the Hebrew calendar, each year was made of 360 days. So are we supposed to believe each day is a billion years, 360 billion years per year for 930 years? That just doesn't make any sense. Let's take a look at what's called the Vav consecutive. Sentences describing the creation event in Genesis 1 begin with the word and. In fact, the sentences accounting for the genealogical records in Genesis also begin with the word and. Well, this is very odd English, but it's excellent Hebrew. By attaching the letter Vav to the uh, end verb of the sentence, this indicates that the events happen in consecutive order. In other words, in six consecutive days, about 6,000 years ago. Let's use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Yom, how it's used in the Old Testament. When it's numbered, like in the first day, or when it's in historical order, like in the chronological records, and this is 359 times outside of Genesis, it always refers to a solar day. When it's used with the evening and or the morning, and that's 38 more times outside of Genesis, it always refers to a solar day. The correct interpretation in Genesis 1 is of a six-day creation, six consecutive days. The plural word for day or days of creation was a Hebrew word yamam, which means solar days everywhere else it's used in the Old Testament. And that's more than 800 times. In fact, yom is used more than 2,300 times in the Old Testament, and only its meaning in Genesis 1 is in question today. And that's not based on Scripture. That's based on secular interpretations of how the strata layers formed. God probably made this so obvious 
because he knew that creation would be the major point of attack from Satan on the authority of his word. Now, on the rare occasion that Yom is used to discuss a concept of time, the verse makes this perfectly clear. You always need to look at the context. In fact, skeptics will try to get you to doubt that the Bible means six days by referring to Psalms 90, verse 4, where it says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Or they'll refer to 2 Peter 3, verse 8, that states that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This is, number one, not talking about a period of time. It's talking about a concept of time, that God created time. He's outside of time. He's not locked into time like you and I are. This has nothing to do with any specific period of time, and it has nothing to do with the creation week. Also, it's not saying that one day and a thousand years are the same thing. It's talking about a concept of time. God's not locked into time like we are. The biblical worldview is given to us in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 by Moses, that God created a perfect universe in a six-day creation, and the genealogical records go from Adam to Jesus, they add up to just about 6,000 years ago. And then we're told that Adam's original sin is what separated us from God, requiring us to be redeemed with God. The first promise of a coming Redeemer is found in Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. We're also told in Scripture that it was this original sin that separated us from God, requiring that Redeemer, and there's the whole foundation for the gospel of Jesus right there. We're also told in Scripture that it was this original sin that allowed death and suffering to enter God's perfect creation. Well, some folks trying to fit secular beliefs of millions and billions of years of death before man into God's Word say, well, maybe there are time gaps within the genealogical records. Well, I would have to ask, where? Actually, it's about 2,000 years back to Christ's resurrection, and the records go back from Jesus back to Abraham, and most scholars don't argue that that was about 4,175 to 180 years ago. And you can go from Abraham all the way back to Adam. They add up to about 6,000 years of time. There's no gaps in those records. All the questions with regard to Scripture and the age of the earth only began about 200 years ago when secularists started saying, wait a minute, those layers of rock laid down by water didn't form in a global flood. They formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time. But those layers are full of fossils, dead things that were laid down in the flood. They are saying that millions of years of death is what brought man into the world. The Bible prophesies in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 6, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and they will be willingly ignorant. They will choose to ignore the overwhelming evidence that by the that the world that was being overflowed with water perished. They will deny the global flood. The Bible tells us by one man sin entered the world and death by man's sin. No wonder the Bible says to teach no other doctrine because when we put death before man's sin, we've eliminated original sin, the resulting separation, and any need for Jesus' death on the cross to reunite us with our loving Creator. No wonder the Bible says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Did you know that the Bible says, don't give heed to endless genealogies, which minister to questions rather than godly edifying? Here are a couple of timelines. At the top is the biblical timeline per Jesus, Moses, and the New Testament authors. We have a six-day creation at the beginning. Jesus came and lived a sinless life and died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and rose again, overcoming death the third day, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, the secular timeline starts out 20 or so billion years ago with a big bang where nothing blew up, and then 4.6 billion years ago, a big rock formed, and it rained on the rock for millions of years, and poof, man just came along in the last million or so years. The biblical timeline, to have these two in scale, the The secular timeline would have to start in London, England, cross the Atlantic, cross the United States, and go to Los Angeles, California to be in scale with the biblical timeline. But notice that the biblical timeline has man-made at the beginning. 
all old earth timelines have man made at the end. And that's interesting because Jesus told us that man was made in the beginning, not in the end. Jesus said that Satan will come immediately and take away the word that was sown in their hearts. We'll talk about taking away the word immediately. The gap theory, trying to blend millions of years of death and suffering into God's word, says, well, maybe there's a gap between Genesis 1, verse 1, and Genesis 1, verse 2. You can't come much more immediately than that. The gap theory violates multiple scriptures, however, and there's that vav consecutive to start out Genesis 1, verse 2, meaning these are meant to be taken as in consecutive order. Not only does it violate multiple scriptures, but a lot of folks have gap theories that say there was an original creation before the creation in scripture. I thought Jesus said we're not to add to or take from his word. And remember, the old earth philosophies put death and suffering before man, eliminating original sin and the resulting separation from Jesus. Yet many Christians claim that the Bible has leeway for billions of years of death and suffering before man and or Darwinian style evolution. In the United States back in the 1800s was a, was a form of creation that had been around since the days of the Greeks known as the Great Chain of Being. This was a belief where a pagan Greek god created everything link by link over long periods of time ending with man. Well, this, of course, puts death and suffering before man. Well, that's been changed today. Now they call this almost the exact same belief, progressive creation, where they've just changed the uh, biblical God in, in place of the uh, pagan Greek God. And they say, well, maybe the biblical God created everything over long periods of death and suffering link by link. But remember, this also puts man at the end and says it's, Death and suffering is what brought man into the world. Keep in mind, the message of the Bible is that man's sin brought death into the world. And all the old earth beliefs say that it was death that brought man into the world. These are total opposites. They don't mix together. This progressive creationist stated, and listen to this carefully, Genesis without consideration suggested by science. In other words, the word of God without looking at the, the radioisotope dating methods in the geologic column, which we cover in our old earth dating methods exposed, Genesis without these considerations is that God created the heavens and the earth in six solar days and man was created on the sixth day. The word of God is that man was created and the world was created in six days, not billions and millions of years of time. In 2 Timothy, we're told that in the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. The Bible says that men will have a form of godliness. Oh, I believe in God, but well, he couldn't have had the power to create like he says he did. And they make up their own forms of God. I don't want to be in their shoes when they stand before their biblical creator. We are to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not to handle the word of God deceitfully. For we preach not ourselves, but of Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves his servants. You know, it's not up to you and I to change God's word. We're not in charge of God's word. Who wants to stand before God on that day and say, you know, Lord, I figure you messed up with that six-day creation thing, so I wrote a best-selling book and misled millions of people not to believe your word. Who wants to stand in front of Jesus on that day and claim that he messed up? Nobody ever raises their hand to that question. The Bible tells us that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy to God's creation. At the end of the sixth day of creation, God looked at his creation and declared it was very good. If it was full of death, evil, and suffering, why would God look at his creation and say that it's very good? That just doesn't make sense. In fact, if death, evil, and suffering were a part of the creation, why will the new creation no more have death, sorrow, or pain in it? That just doesn't make sense. 
Well, some folks still trying to fit millions of years into God's word will say, well, maybe they were pre-Adamite men before God breathed the soul into them. They've been fooled into thinking that some missing links have been found. They need to see our 50 facts versus Darwinism in the textbooks because all of the supposed missing links between ape and men have been proven to be 100% ape or 100% human or 100%, let's be nice and say mistakes, although many are deliberate frauds. So folks still trying to blend in millions of years into God's word will say, well, maybe the Bible is only referring to human death coming after man's original sin. Well, the Bible tells us that after Adam and Eve committed their original sin, that God, and this is the first death recorded in scripture, took an innocent animal and made coats of skin for Adam and Eve to temporarily cover their sin. Well, if things were dying left and right all over the place, it really takes away from the first death being to cover man's sin. Also, if the death of animals was a part of the creation, why in the new creation that Jesus will give us in the future will the wolf dwell with the lamb and the lion will eat straw like an ox? Why will there be no more death and suffering in the new creation? The reason is, is that there was no death and suffering in the original creation. It was man's sin that brought death and suffering into God's perfect world. In Genesis, we're told that to everything that creeps upon the earth, God gave every green herb for meat. Plants were made as the food source in the original creation. Everything was vegetarian. There was no death, evil, or suffering in the creation. Well, people still trying to put millions of years into God's word will say, well, this proves that plants were dying before man's sin. Well, plants are not the same as living creatures. Man and vertebrates are referred to in scripture as nephesh chaya, which translates living souls or living creatures. This term is never used for plants or invertebrates. In the days of the Israelites, in fact, in the days of Elijah, the Israelites were taking the scriptural God and mixing in pagan beliefs in their worship of him. And this was not acceptable to God in those days. So Elijah extolled the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If not, follow Baal. In other words, worship the real God if you believe he's the real God. Stop walking on the fence with one foot in the secular world and one foot in the scriptural world of true Christianity. A year is defined by the Earth's revolution around the sun, and a month is defined by the moon's revolution around the Earth. We get a day by one spin of the Earth on its axis. So where does a week come from? A week comes from the biblical creation. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. This is also repeated in Exodus 20, verse 11, in the middle of the Ten Commandments. But some folks will say, well, Russ, telling people that the Bible really means six days just a few thousand years ago is divisive. Well, I say that's sad. I'm sorry if it's divisive to tell people the Bible's true, but the Bible is true. In Luke, we're told that Jesus said, suppose that I have come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. In John, we're told there was a division among the people because of Jesus. The truth has always divided. If you stand for the truth, there are gonna be people that are not going to like it. They're not going to accept it. Our job as Christians is to stand firm for the truth of God's word. It's up to the Holy Spirit to use that information to bring people to him. But our job is certainly not to compromise the inspired word of God. Jesus said, and he warned, that not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and this and that in your name and other many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye worker of inequity. Those are words that should scare any true believer into not compromising the inspired word of our biblical creator, redeemer, and savior, 
Lord Jesus the Christ. We are to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. I hope and I pray that the information in our DVDs and DVD study series will increase your faith in the inspired Word of God and get you to realize we can trust God's Word and believe it word for word and cover to cover. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I hope and I pray that the information we've shared today will be a blessing to many, getting us to humble ourselves and accept your inspired Word as you've given it to us. It is in Jesus' great name that I do pray, amen.